thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, the, the, the same thing in New York as here. Uh, it was basically late June weather from Halloween to Christmas, and then, and, and then suddenly this. So I'm uh, uh, very pleased you braved it. And I'm very pleased to be back near Cleveland. Uh, I, uh, when I was at Columbia, uh, I fell in with the Barnard girl for, for quite a long time, and she lived in Cleveland. And in that wonderful age, I could fly out there on weekends for $34 round trip student standby. And it was a, it was a, what a great city to visit. They, I mean, I'm, you can tell from my books I like amusement parks. You had the great, the great and tragically vanished Euclid Beach, which I found as interesting as Venice, and um, a wonderful museum with a Mercer race about in it. Uh, but no better city to visit. I've always been pleased by my time in Cleveland. So uh, anyway, I'm here to show the flag about my. Uh, my book, it's about the only, it says on the cover, the only mutiny in the United States Naval history, which is perfectly true, but, but and I mean, spent a hell of a lot of time with this subject, I'm still not sure it really was a mutiny. It, it, it was an unusual and, and difficult topic, and uh, when I was working on it, my and with telling my friends about it, <laughs> they, they all wanted to know how, uh, questions that were meant to be sympathetic but were sort of alarming. How'd you find a subject that obscure? <laughs> what, what, or why are you doing this? <laughs> and uh, it just got under my skin. So I thought I'd talk maybe a little about what drew me to it and how, how I came to be writing about this. Uh, when, when in the spring of 2020, uh, the COVID virus settled in for its long stay, I shared the general sense of dislocation and claustrophobia, but I also saw what I thought was a vagrant beam of sunlight. I write books. And here at last was the prospect of a prolonged break in my routine that would help keep me honorably at my desk. Well, fat chance, far from freeing me to write a book, I discovered the enforced hiatus made it difficult even to read one. I had written some popular, or so I hoped, Histories on various subjects, the Battle of the Atlantic and World War II, Henry Ford, the creation of Disneyland, and I'd enjoyed working on these. But now, with the contagion blowing soundlessly past my computer, every idea I tried to prod into life seemed either silly or boring, or worse, a whole lot of work. So between, you know, hourly errands to make sure the cat was comfortable or to check on the current humidity, the zenith of my computer expertise, or, uh, you know, general time wasting that I think writers are better at than people in other professions, I began to think back further. And I am fortunate enough to have spent much of my career at American Heritage Magazine whose spacious franchise uh, was everything that ever happened in the United States of America on this continent. So here had to be a rich source from which to mine, to, to, to mine a book. But anxiety is a poor research assistant, and I suspect that many in my position have set out with hopes that some fresh lead to find only a gluey, soporific redundancy the Battle of Manila Bay, the Oklahoma land rush, little Virginia writing to see if there really is a Santa Claus. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of these subjects, but how familiar they all felt. And then one morning I woke up 
with the word or name Somers in my mind. And it struck a distant heritage chord, and I went to the magazine's valuable website. It's still up at the, the, the physical magazine no longer comes up, but that it, its website is still there and has every article the magazine ever ran since uh, its birth in 1954, and it's, 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 it's a great resource. Anyway, uh, I was plunder plundering that and found an article called Panic on the High Seas, which had appeared in 1961, uh, drawn from a book by Frederick F. Vandewater. And that was called, The Captain Called It Mutiny. And as I read the story, both titles came to seem increasingly appropriate. Here's what I found out. On the evening of December 14th, 1842, the United States Brig of War Somers sailed into New York Harbor at the end of an unusual voyage. Our modernizing Navy was looking to shed some old traditions. And among them was the ancient way of training its sailors, which had always been simply to drop them aboard a ship. Now, to be sure, any adolescent will learn plenty about his new life by going through even a single storm at sea, but the Navy was, our Navy was outgrowing its learning by doing youth. And the Somers had been chosen as America's first seagoing school dedicated to offering young sailors systematic training rather than hoping they'd simply absorb it during the course of the working day. But this worthy aim was not what made the Somers voyage unusual. Her captain, Alexander Slidell Mackenzie, came ashore into the Brooklyn Navy Yard with astonishing news. The ship full of teenagers under his command had nearly carried off a mutiny that would have left many of the 120-man crew murdered, along with all but one of the officers. And that was just the beginning. The mutineers would then have turned the Somers into a pirate. And she would have made a perfect one. Uh, with her 10 heavy guns, she could outfight any merchant ship. And being brand new and the fastest vessel in the American service could outrun anything bigger. Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, asked his readers, how many hundreds of worthy men would have been murdered in cold blood? How many women would have been devoted to a fate infinitely more horrible than the most cruel death that the hellish ingenuity of devils could devise? Now, Greeley, Greeley was excitable, but he wasn't a fantasist. To the New York of the 1840s, a town whose life was nourished by the sea, pirates were not the chummy rascals you can visit today in a Disney park. They were remembered as well-armed, well-trained bands of assassins that specialized in arson, maiming, plunder, murder, and rape. So thank God for Captain Mackenzie, who staved off calamity, said the Herald, with a boldness and decision that can only be paralleled in the early history of the Roman Republic. The Herald's rival inquirer added to the praise, and it was now sparkling through uh, all the city press. Sufficient is known already to establish beyond a question the necessity, imperative and immediate, however dreadful, of the course pursued by Commander Mackenzie than whom a more humane, conscientious, and gallant officer does not hold a commission in the Navy of the United States. But what was dreadful about Mackenzie's course? He'd hanged three of the mutineers. This was harsh, certainly, but surely better than losing the Somers, most of her crew, and the other ships the newly minted pirate would have attacked. But there the matter, might, might, matter, uh, the matter might have rested had not a letter appeared a few days later in a Washington, D.C. newspaper. Captain Mackenzie's account of the events had his ship simmering on the verge of combustion with every passing day bringing the crisis closer until at the last possible hour he had destroyed the mutinous beast. 
This new letter told a different story. The accused head of the plot had been in double irons at the time of the executions, so closely confined that he couldn't have stood upright, let alone led an uprising. The ship had been cruising in perfect peace for days through the densely populated Virgin Island when health could have been summoned in a few hours. That there had been no disturbances among the crew when the three mutineers, bosun's mate Samuel Cromwell, Seaman Alicia Small, and acting midshipman Philip Spencer were noosed and hanged. The letter's tone was crisp and calm throughout, never suggesting the writer had any personal connection with the events it detailed, save for one sad hint. Of Philip Spencer, the writer says that the paper gave his age as over 20. Had he lived, he would have been 19 the 28th of January next. The letter was signed only by a cryptical initial, S, but the identity of its author soon got out. He was John Spencer, one of the most powerful legal minds of his day and President John Tyler's Secretary of War. And Philip Spencer was his dead son. No chance now that the story would soon blow over. Rather, as the great naval historian Samuel Eliot Morrison remarked, no case of the century prior to the assassination of President Lincoln aroused as much interest and passion. The case revolved around its two principles. Uh, Captain McKenzie, of course, who carried out the death penalty arrived at by a council of officers that he had convened in a sort of mock court-martial and Philip Spencer, whom he believed to be the chief conspiracy. Mutineer or not, Spencer was a difficult fellow, moody, slyly insolent, surly to his fellow officers, but overly gregarious with the crew. Here's the first impression uh, of Spencer that we have. It's uh, as a sailor. It's from a fellow sailor, uh, an, another midshipman who uh, had been with him in the 1840s and spoke about it 50 years later. They did not become friends exactly, but the midshipman, a man named Roger, said, I held a certain intimacy with him. One day I asked him, Spencer, it seems to me that you are a mutinous, insubordinate sort of fellow, kicking apart, kicking up against discipline, always in hot water. Where, where in the, what, what in the devil's name and Induced you to enter the service. I hardly know, said Spencer. The fact is, I wasn't a model boy by any means. Pretty bad, lawless if you like. And my father, perhaps to get rid of me, perhaps to reform me, put me in the Navy. I am uh, disposed to think it has done me harm. And you don't like it then? Like it? Like it? Hell no, I hate it. Rogers, what would you like instead? That's hard to say, but I think I would like to own a vessel that can outsail anything afloat and a crew that would go to hell for me. Well, it's sort of clear. And about the most constructive thing Spencer had done as a student was to donate to the school library a lurid history of buccaneering called The Pirate's Own Story. Pirates and piracy had long fascinated Philip Spencer. And the hobby cost him his life. A couple of months into the voyage, he way waylaid the ship's assistant purser, James Wales. No known reason why he chose him swore him to secrecy, and with the two crouched in one of the few corners of privacy the small brig afforded, said that Spencer and his confederates were going to seize the ship, swing the guns inboard to cover the decks, butcher the officers, and lead those crewmen who had been allowed to keep their lives into a paradise of looted treasure and fragrant tropical isles. He would make whales one of his officers. 
Did that please the purser? Oh, yes, it did, said Wales. And then, of course, as soon as he could get away, he hurried to tell the first lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Gert Gansevert. Uh, all American literature is in Lieutenant Gansevert's debt, as he persuaded his first cousin, Herman Melville, that it might be interesting to go to sea. Now, of course, Gansevert immediately reported the plot to Captain McKenzie, who thought it was a joke. The scheme, he said, seemed to me so monstrous, so improbable, that I could not forbear treating it with ridicule. I was under the impression that Mr. Spencer had been reading some piratical stories and had amused himself with Mr. Wales. This mature, rational response was fleeting. In a matter of hours, the captain was seeing ominous signs everywhere. Uh, strange expressions, uh, stuff like that on sailors' faces. Uh, he took no comfort from the presence of his officers, even though he had them on night-long armed patrol, regularly passing past midshipman Spencer, now changed and sitting on an arms chest. And rumors crackled throughout the vessel, and a miasma of panic began to rise from it. This is really, in many ways, a, a narrative of hysteria. But there was no mutiny. The three accused ringleaders were hanged and buried at sea, and the Somers returned to a storm of publicity, a court of inquiry, and the court-martial of Captain Mackenzie. Now, the court of inquiry was just that, an exercise to determine facts. It could prefer no charges. The court-martial, on the other hand, put Mackenzie on trial for his life. It's a little surprising how eagerly the captain pushed for it until one sees that Philip Spencer's father, again, one of the ablest lawyers in the country, was doing his formidable best to get his son's executioner in front of a civil rather than a military court. The elder Spencer was sure a naval trial would go easier on one of its own, and that is what happened. Uh, the captain wasn't exactly exonerated, but the case was found not proved. The Navy's own feelings about it are reflected by the fact that for a whole generation, the Somers mutiny was a taboo subject at officers' mess table discussions. So after a few weeks of reading, I found myself wondering if there was a book in this. True, it was the US Navy's only mutiny, if mutiny it was. And the incident did lead directly to the founding of the US Naval Academy, a much delayed happy ending, but which a century later proved the seedbed of the most powerful fleet the world has ever known. Nevertheless, I was worried that it might boil down to a mere anecdote and a kind of depressing one at that. But I did feel it was high time to let Colin Harrison, my editor at Scribner, know I was still alive, so I wrote it up as a proposal, and Colin, who was a fearless type, shot right back and told me to go ahead. So as I started the book in earnest, my heart sank because I immediately encountered two sources whose value I, I was just too stupid to spot quickly. The, the first came from Captain McKenzie himself. It turned out, rather surprisingly, that he had written in the 1830s a highly popular book about his travels in Spain. Now, the Navy has long been a little suspicious about, suspicious about seafaring authors, unless their subjects are gunnery or title charts. But two centuries ago, the service was proud enough of Mackenzie's success to order copies of his Spain book put aboard every US warship. Well, good for Mackenzie, but this didn't make me any more eager to read a three-volume collection of archaic travel reminiscences. And by God, once he'd finished with Spain, the captain sat down and given England the same treatment. And it took me longer than it should have to realize what a singular stroke of luck this really was for me. So much that happened aboard the Somers on her lethal cruise flowed from the captain 
And here I was, having to study a long dead, mid-level naval officer who had, and this wouldn't have been true of any other sailor in the service, who had bequeathed me hundreds of pages of first-person narrative from which to try and tease clues about his character and personality. And they were certainly were there. Well, one example may suffice. Uh, Captain McKenzie is patriotic. His book swarms with tributes to the American flag. He is energetic and observant. He is unfailingly moralistic. There is little from which a reader might predict the catastrophe to come when he took Philip Spencer aboard his ship. Yet here and there, he shows a relish for violence that approaches the prurient. Outside of Tarragona in Spain, highwaymen stopped Mackenzie's stagecoach. The driver gave him his purse and begged for his life. Instead, one of the bandits began to beat him on the head with a rock. Here's what Mackenzie says. The murderer retoubled his blows until, growing furious in the task, he laid his musket beside him and worked with both hands upon his victim. The supplication, which blows had first excited, blows at length quelled. They had gradually increased with the suffering to the most terrible shrieks, then declined into low and articul inarticulate moans until a deep drawn and agonied gasp for breath and an occasional convulsion alone remained to show that the vital principle had not yet departed. Now, meanwhile, a second robber was setting about Pepe, the mule boy, with a knife. Its blows are described with the same unsettling thoroughness. I could distinctly hear each stroke of the murderous knife as it entered the victim. It was not a blunt sound as a weapon that meets with positive resistance, but a hissing noise as if the household implement made to part the bread of peace performed unwillingly its task of treachery. Although a priest in the carriage hid his face within his trembling fingers, Mackenzie said his own eyes seemed spellbound for I could not withdraw them from the cruel spectacle. Now, of course, he was an unwilling witness, but other times he sought out such spectacles. A few weeks later, he attends a public execution in France. And the feeling of oppression and abasement of utter disgust with which I came from it, such as to make me form a tacit never resolution never to be present at another. That resolution lasts three weeks until he reaches Madrid, where he sees a short notice that the proper authorities would proceed to put to death two evildoers, and goes on to give a 10-page account of their death throes. Once again, remorse and disgust. And once again, he then takes himself to witness another death, this one a garroting. It was sure to be a spectacle full of horror and painful excitement. Still, I determined to witness it. I felt sad and melancholy, and yet, by a strange perversion, I was eager to feel more so. One does remember Captain Mackenzie's execution tourism as he orders his three mutineers hoisted from the deck of the Somers. I was at first equally opaque about the value of another critical source, and here my reluctance came from a simple peevishness about having to read tiny type. Uh, but that was all there was on offer in the pages of the transcripts of the Court of Inquiry and the Court Martial. At least it did not take me so long to realize that for the small price of having to squint, I was able to eavesdrop on what people actually said. Any newspaper of the 1840s in reporting a harsh conversation would run something like, he rounded on his adversary with an oath. In a trial transcripts, he will call his adversary a son of a bitch. The language lives on the page. Here is Wales giving damning testimony about Spencer, having been asked if the midshipman had said anything about his plans for the small boys. And most of the boys aboard the Somers are small. Yes, sir, he said. That small fry eat a large quantity of biscuit. 
and that they were a useless article aboard a vessel, and that he should make away with them. And on Spencer trying to curry favor with the crew, Wales had seen him hand out two bunches of cigars at a time, and I have seen him give tobacco and cigars to the smaller boys, saying when he gave them to them, he knew it was contrary to the rules of the vessel, but to give it to them anyway, but if the commander would not let them have it, he would accommodate them. Here, Midshipman Perry of the famous nautical family grows passionate when asked if the Somers could have gotten help from a friendly port. It was discussed as to whether she could be taken into St. Thomas, and I, in answer, said I would rather go overboard than go into St. Thomas for protection, that I would never agree to a thing of that kind. Why? Because I thought it would be a disgrace to the United States, the Navy, and particularly to the officers of the brig. My reasons were that if an American man of war could not protect herself, no use in having any. Well, better, better to hang a few crewmen than get embarrassed in front of a British officer. Well, despite their miniature, their minuscule type, these transcripts were a godsend. Uh, their, their energetic question and answer format of helping, I think, to lend momentum to the narrative. And my book is finished, and for the moment at least, COVID is seems to be on the wane, but sometimes when I'm on the fringes of sleep, I, I still hear those distant voices. And even with the book long finished, parts of it still nag at me. Sometimes when I was writing on it, I felt I was working on a murder mystery rather than the sea story, because many of Captain Mackenzie's actions remain baffling to me. Uh, naturally, I speculate on their causes in the book. I, I do think the hangings were unnecessary. But in the end, I find myself thinking of something Lieutenant Gansevoort's cousin Herman Melville wrote. He gave his book, White Jacket, the subtitle, The World in a Man of War. He meant just that. A ship is its own world carrying it with always the idiosyncrasies and unknowable corners and reckless passions of the world itself. Outwardly regarded, he writes, our craft is a lie. For all that is outwardly seen of it is the clean swept deck, the off-pated planks comprised above the waterline, whereas the vast mass of our fabric with all its storerooms of secrets forever slides along far beneath the surface. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll uh, take some questions with our author who wants to be first. Step on up. This is more a comment than a question. I'm a big fan of JAG. Oh, be what? A TV show called JAG, Judge Advocate General. And they had a episode on the uh, Summers uh, Mutiny. No kidding! I'd heard of it before tonight. It's uh, season six, episode uh, 16, I think. Let me look it up. There's also an interesting book called Secrets of a Buccaneer Scholar by a guy named Bach, whose uh, father wrote Jonathan Livingston Siegel. And uh, yeah, season, season six, episode 23. And uh, for, for, from time to time, they'll do these episodes where it's a completely different uh, setting and storyline than their usual. It's, it's a, a crime procedural uh, huh. with the Naval you know, Legal Service. Wow. So. Wow, that, that's. Fascinating. Who yeah. wants to be next? <laughs> All right. Here you go. Thank you. Uh, in the beginning of the movie The Cane Mutiny, it says there's never been a 
a mutiny yes. in the United States Navy. So I take it they don't count the Summers as a, as a mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, I, I I I think you could make the argument that it wasn't a true mutiny, but it certainly. Uh, but it seems to me if you get three people hanged for it, you can call it a mutiny. <laughs> and the Kane the Kane mutiny uh, my, uh, 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 I. Always glad to hear it brought up. It was it, my 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 father was an architect, but he spent uh, two years in the North Atlantic aboard the destroyer escort and helped sink the uh, German submarine U five four six. A better day's work than I've ever done. <laughs> and he thought the Kane mutiny. He read it to me when I was barely old enough to understand it. Uh, and he said that all his service extreme, you know, totally different. The K mutiny is in the, is, is a is the K mutiny is aboard a disintegrating <laughs> nearly mine mine sweeper in the Pacific and uh, not not a sub chaser in the Atlantic. But he said it's the only book he read that made him that really reconstructed the past for him. It really made him feel like he was being there. And it's also a hell of a good story. I, I, I'm, 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 it's, it's, well, I thoroughly enjoy the Kane mutiny. Yeah, me too. It's a great fun. Uh, I'll ask you do you see Do you see any parallels between Captain McKenzie and Captain Between? Bly, between the captain of the Summers and Captain Bly? Oh. I mean, as far as uh, their as their command styles. Well, and... not not really. The uh, the, the um, he, uh, Captain Bly was uh, fierce and abrupt, <laughs> and, and so was Captain Quig. Uh, the, 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 the Captain Mackenzie seemed to think of himself as a gentleman and liked to think of himself. As a sweet-natured, gentle person, he uh, he would send nice tidbits of food down to sick boys. He prided himself on his uh, delicacy in dealing with people and, and his gentlemanliness. But he also flogged his adolescent crew so severely that it horrified the uh, commandant of the Brooklyn Navy Yard, who in 1844 was no wuss. Uh, and um, he seems to have, uh, he seems to just have a sort of connoisseur's love of inflicting pain. It's, it, it seemed to me from from reading his books, but uh, but he's uh, the books the, the, the books are he, he he's insufferable not because he seems cruel in them but because he seems so damn pleased with himself all the time. Uh, but he um, but they're not you know they're not badly written. If you're dying to read about Spain in the 1830s, <laughs> you could do worse. <laughs> but 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 um, but you don't. But I, I, uh, but I detected none of, I detected nothing that, that I thought, well, this could lead to violence with the crew until I read the log of the punishments that he administered. And uh, again, his, 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 his poetic reconstructions of the various uh, killings he saw. He's, well, Bly complained about silent insolence and his crew. Oh yes, when you mentioned, when you mentioned that earlier, that, that's kind of what brought the question to yeah. uh, to mind. <laughs> yeah, they, then they gave him a sugar plantation to run, and they mutinied on that, didn't they? Oh yeah. <laughs> well, Captain Bly was well known as an excellent captain, but a terrible administrator, and also when circumstances were difficult, the true leader came out, but when circumstances were easy, he couldn't deal with it. Huh. And the, small, the smallest things he would perceive is directed as a, an insult to him. I've had whole days like that. <laughs> Thank you. 
Was flogging still a standard practice in those days? Yeah, not for long, not for long. Uh, just just a few years later, but there there were lots of uh, there, there were um, there, there, there 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 was strong resistance to abolishing it, and but it's sort of it, it's sort of startling how quite awful it it, it really was. Uh, you you it was. Strictly limited, you could only you could only uh, the ship's captain could only um, could not uh, call for more than twelve lashes without convening a court martial. But um, but twelve lashes with these uh, heavy braided fabrics could uh, could kill a man. <laughs> it was extraordinary. Also, how many? Do you have any idea how many mutinies there were in the Royal Navy over the course of time? Um, I, I, I don't. There, you, you, you have so, there's so many more ships to work with there. Uh, there, there was. The, I know that the the, the 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 one they all most hated, I think, was the Hermione when the when the crew not only seized the ship but turned it over to the Spanish enemies. Uh, that, that, that 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 they chased the. Uh, <laughs> they they chased the crewman who was escaped for years after that, but um, I I don't think it was a towering number. I mean, it might, maybe perhaps a dozen. I don't know. That. Can you tell us about some of the places you visited? Uh, you mentioned the transcripts. Where did you get those from? And did you find anything else? This was this was this is one of the this is one of the great. <laughs> The great things about doing research in the age of the computer, the, the, in the age of the computer, and, and to be able to search for things. The uh, transcripts were all published fully by uh, by by the uh, by the New York Tribune, and then they came out in uh, and they brought them out in handsomely bound little volumes, uh, very sturdy little volumes, type too small, as I said, but uh, otherwise great. And I was able to, I was able to buy them all up for about fourteen bucks a piece. Uh, I, I, I mean, it's, it's it's so wonderful to be able to, to be able to call in lots and lots of books from. I, I use the advanced book exchange. I mean, stuff. It, 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 if I'd had to go to the library to do this, I would barely have started the first chapter. I, I feel very lucky. Okay. Do you think the same results would have happened to Spencer if the captain had a seasoned crew instead of a training ship? Oh, I th I, I think so many things would have been different. If the ship was uh, if the ship was also overcrowded, and every warship sailed with a guard of a guard of Marines, uh, this the, 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 a component of the Marines, but they had so many schoolboys stuffed into this one that uh, that they only had room for one Marine, a, 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 a master of Marines, but he was sick, and so there was so there was a, an entire peacekeeping force long established in our Navy that just didn't exist on that ship. Yes, I think I, I, I and I uh, and I also think the, uh, the 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 fact that there were so many youngsters uh, who and you can imagine how they would have been reacting to all, all of this. I, I think it was a a very fluid and undisciplined situation that the uh, that the um, that the the captain didn't talk about the difficulty of controlling it, but uh, but it must have been considerable. And the very fact that nothing nothing like it ever happened again in the service uh, suggests that the situation was unusual. He uh, he uh, after. The, the, there, there were some. The, the findings were controversial. President Tyler uh, 
thought he was guilty as hell and uh, was sore that he didn't have the authority to reverse the findings of the court martial. Um, the uh, he was immediate. Tyler immediately saw that he had taken away command of the Somers, and he briefly got one more one more seagoing command of, of a few years later during the war with Mexico. But he he, he died surprisingly young. He had a, he liked to go horseback riding in the morning, and he came back from a ride, and the groom came to help him off his horse and found he was dead, and he was 45 years old. Uh, no, or by, <laughs> or, or by the, the vengeance spirit of, of mankind. <laughs> there was no evidence before this incident that he had ever had difficulties on his ship? Yes, uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, so, so, someone, uh, so, 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 some, some awfully good researcher turned up that, that, that they, he'd found a, on... We had, he, he was, the, the, we had a, a, an anti-slavery patrol in the in, in the in the waning days of the slave trade that had lots of had lots of little ships with ludicrous armaments. This was a three-gun ship, a two-gun ship, and uh, he uh, he had command of a couple of them, and one of the sailors on one of them, a very literate man, wrote a extremely long and damning account I, I quote from it in the book before before any before he came before he'd ever heard of the somers uh, saying that this this th th this guy is punishing people not not to maintain discipline but because he likes it well thank you very much Thank you, everybody. Thank you.